Hello everybody, today I'm going to be finally returning to the Yogurt Cinematic Universe with a triple feature. That's right, I'm going to be reading three LLBs by Icy Opportunity 9, the creator of this universe, and it's going to be lit, so make sure to get some snacks ready. Now, if you guys don't know what the Yogurt Cinematic Universe is, essentially some legend on Reddit started a fanfiction series based off a Diary of a Wimpy Kid, obviously, and all the stories fit in one timeline universe, and I've already actually read the Albert Sandy trilogy as well as a couple other of the fanfics in separate videos that fall into this universe. So I'll leave a link to the playlist in the description. I highly recommend you go check those out before watching this video then come back to this later Because like I said it all falls into one timeline so everything will be much clearer So yeah, there's gonna be a link in the description and in the end cards of this video to that playlist and Every yogurt cinematic universe video will be in there So yeah, if you haven't already make sure to hit that subscribe button if you love wimpy kid I hit the notification bell not to miss another fan fiction. So yeah, let's get straight into it previously on the yogurt verse Great Uncle Arthur came over, but he was actually secretly helping Preston Mudd stalk girls, and he got arrested. So yeah, and then uh, I accidentally skipped a fan fiction, so that's what I'm going to be reading first today. Then we also read Joshie's True Face, which I'll do a recap of after I read this. So without further ado, we're going to be reading Die of Wimpy Kid The Roleplay Club, which is episode 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 of the Yogurt Verse. Let's get straight into it. Tuesday. Normally, I don't pay much attention to the stuff on the bulletin board at school since it's always about sports teams, student council elections, or other similar stuff. However, today I noticed the Tower of Druids poster on it. Attention gamers, Towers of Druids Roleplay Club. Tower of Druids roleplays are held at Papa Tony's Pizza from 1.30am to 3.30am on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Please do not come as Ephius, Equam, Stoxar, Woxius, or Crixen, as they are already taken. Please be Oneus or Acne, as we still need those two. Personally, I'm not a keen on the idea of pretending to be some fictional character, but the hours on the poster intrigued me. How many kids are going to be up at 1am on a school night? Either that poster is a prank or whoever made it is definitely up to something, and I'm going to find out what's going on. I decided to ask Rowley and Holly if they wanted to go, but I guess the whole idea of the club being on a school night put them off. 1am, a pop of Tony's, anybody in? My parents are going to kill me if they find out. This is going to reflect on my grades. And that was only the beginning of my problems. When I got home, I remembered that Oneas and Acne, the two characters that they were missing, were both girls. Pretty unfortunate since I could have gotten Holly to be one of them. Good thing I still have my disguise, so I could pass up as a girl. Plus I can steal m some mom's makeup to make myself look more convincing. I guess the only thing I need to do is set my alarm to 1am and hope I don't accidentally wake anybody up. Wednesday. I woke up at 1 in the morning thanks to my alarm. I'm sorry to think that I should have gone to bed earlier because I only got about 3 hours of sleep. After that, I put on my disguise and went downstairs, only to find Roderick and his bandmates watching a horror movie, so I guess I'm not the only one sneaking around. Hey Rod, that chick's smoking, is she your girlfriend or something? Maybe then my disguise is a little too convincing, because Bill thought I was an actual girl and I had to take my wig off to prove him wrong. Eventually, I was able to convince Roger to drive to Pop Tony's with the promise that he and his friends could all get some more soda and pizza. Unfortunately, they all decided to go, despite Roger's van only having two seats, and Roger's attempt to solve the seating problem didn't go well. Eventually, we got to Pop Tony's, and surprisingly enough, the Tower of Druids Club was real. Harder, stick it in the brown. Oh, yeah. I'm not sure how serious this club is, because I don't remember stocks um, making out in the original graphic novel. After I introduced myself, I chose to play as Oneas, and she's pretty badass for a girl. Then I quickly realized this club was a total joke. Hey guys, there's five of us and one of her. Guess what that means? Say what? Thanks to these guys, I don't know what a gangbang is like, and I had the misfortune of pretending to take part in one. According to Amelia Mendoza, who appears to be the club presence, all I had to do was make cutie style moaning noises, okay. Which I think would I would be more suited to those weird cart which I think would be more suited to those weird cartoons Leland watches. As far as I know, Oneas does not get gang banged in the original graphic novels. Plus she's got this really cool sword called the Star Saber, so she'd probably be able to fend off these guys. Though Emilio conveniently told me that I'd be unarmed for the gangbang. I thought Roderick would be laughing at me for this, but he was too busy arguing with the guy at the counter. What do you mean you've run out? Anyways, the roleplay club was laughable. It was almost as if the guys had just named themselves after Towers of Druids characters then proceeded to talk about whatever they felt like. At one point, Tyson Sanders got his character to watch a video of a dog falling down a flight of stairs, despite the Tower of Druids being set in the medieval era. This proceeded to go on for the next half hour, until I blacked out and woke up in front of our house. I'm not sure if the whole roleplay club was just a dream, or if I really did get knocked out. But that club's up to something, and they probably don't want me to find out what it is. 
I ended up getting something like five hours of sleep, but I'm pretty sure that wasn't enough because I was still tired when I caught up. Anyway, so when I caught up with Rowling and Holly, I told them about my experience with the club, and they spent 10 minutes talking about my character getting gangbanged. Ew, that's nasty. What does gangbang mean? I guess telling Rowley about that part was a mistake, because then I'd tell him what a gangbang was. I hope he doesn't tell his parents about this, because they are gonna know I told him about it. Uh, I guess it's like one girl and three more guys, and do they do uh, things. The truth is, the only stuff I know about gangbangs comes from Playboys that I found in Roderick's room. And anyway, what really puzzles me is what a role pl the roleplay club is up to. I saw them at lunch, but all they were whispering- they were all just whispering things to each other and giggling, almost like they were trying to hide some kind of secret. I kept an eye on them for the rest of the day, but they just kept going and doing that throughout the afternoon. So I ended up deciding that the only way to find out what they were really up to was to see where they went after school. As it turns out, the club went their separate ways after school and we had to choose one member to follow. I decided that Emilio Mendoza would be the best choice since he appeared to be the club president. When Emilio got home, he flopped down on the couch and went to sleep. Strangely enough, Tyson Sanders was pacing around the room, keeping guard. I'm not sure why he was doing that, but I'm pretty sure it was because Emilio was hiding something in his house. We sat there for a half hour and nothing happened, apart from Tyson walking in circles over and over again. And after watching that for a few hours, I started to go a little nuts, so we bailed out. Thursday. Only now did I remember that I have English class with Christopher and Tyson, so I could see if they do anything suspicious. Though, since they do have a bit of a rep, I won't be surprised if something happens. I've got mixed feelings about that English class. On the one hand, Holy's in it, but on the other, we've got Mr. Blakely, and he can't stand any mischief. So I was pretty surprised when Christopher Brownfield wrote a note and told this kid sitting next to him to pass it to Tyson. Mr. Blakely stuck Christopher and Tyson on opposite sides of the room, and they kept talking too much in class. So nearly every kid got the note at some point, and eventually it got to Holly. Greg, could you please pass this note to Tyson? Okay, sure. Wait, wait a minute. It was at this point that I realized I hadn't told Holly that or Rally that both Tyson and Christopher were part of the roleplay club, and that the note probably had something to do with it. But before I had the chance to make to take the note, Mr. Blakely turned around, and boy was he mad. Mr. Heavily and Miss Hills, you think passing notes around is funny? I bet you won't find detention funny. To make a long story short, me and Holly got detention while Christopher and Tyson got off scot-free, despite them being the culprits. It's not like they were trying to hide the fact that they got away with the note passing incident. With me and Holly in detention, there was only one thing I could do, send Rowley after them. Rowley wasn't, himself wasn't too keen on going alone, so I told him he could bring a partner with him, and I tried to convince him to pick Shirog, but he ended up settling for Colin Lee, who I'd forgotten about ages ago. Since I forgot what kind of a person Colin was, I just gave Rowley the green light and sent him off while me and Holly went to detention. We sat in detention for an hour, and all I could think of was what we were doing in there for something we didn't do. While the offenders were off doing something, I don't know what, if there is anything that Tyson Sanders and Christopher Brownfield should learn, it's to never mess with Greg Hefley, because these two won't see what'll happen to them. Friday, if I'm going to get revenge on Christopher and Tyson, it'll definitely be by thwarting their plan. At least that's what I thought as I pretended to head to Papa Tony's. When I got out, I was surprised to see that Roderick was waiting for me. I guess he and his bandmates really want pizza at midnight. Hey, ready for the pizza run, Greg Ed? We went to Papa Tony's and I discovered that the roleplay guys were acting even more obnoxious than usual. Hey, Emilio, here comes that girl. Can we do the gangbang again? Yes, definitely. Get ready, boys. George Fleer wanted to do a physical version of the skit from yesterday, but I came up with a better idea. Can we do a battle or something that actually happens in the book? Aw, oh, come on, that's no fun. The roleplay guy seemed pretty unhappy with my idea until Emilio decided that he was on board with me, though he did make a few changes to my original plan. You won't stand a chance to my Diet Coke-filled condom, Iquam. Yeah, right, Waxius. My dildo shall win this. For whatever reason, all our characters were naked and we were fighting with uh, adult toys. I'm not sure how these guys know so much about this stuff, but I do know that they don't want me here because they killed my character off during the battle and they knocked me out again. Really though, they're up to something. When I got to school, me and Holly went to tell Vice Principal Roy about the unfair decision we got, unfair detention we got yesterday. Sadly, he just told us it wasn't worth complaining about since we already served our detention. Plus, he claimed we needed visual proof that Tyson and Christopher were involved in the note passing, even though the classrooms hadn't got any security cameras. On the plus side, he did give us a note back, and it turned out to be a drawing of a horse making a rude gesture. I bet Tyson saw us while we were spying on Emilio, and this was, his suppo his, this was supposed to get us in trouble. At lunch, we asked Rally how this Emilio watching session went, and unfortunately, the news wasn't good. Apparently, when he and Colin tried to get close to Emilio's house, they got chased by Nicky Wood with a taser, and don't ask me where you got that from. 
Uh, Rowley got away, but Colin got tasered and taken away. I guess that Emilio found out he was being watched, and he upped the security on his property. Now he can't even go near his house anymore. In other news, the roleplay poster was gone. I'm not sure why Emilio took it down, but I'm guessing it had something to do with me joining them, even though they didn't know it was me. Saturday. Me and Rowley went to Papa Tony's on the weekend to see if Tony decided to reintroduce the grape soda. We hadn't, uh, he hadn't, and the place was starting to smell funky. Uh, you been smoking in here, son? No, but can you start selling grape soda again? Tony didn't seem too impressed with that, and he asked us if, you wanted any, if we wanted anything, but after asking him if the barbecue chicken pizza was available again, he told us to leave. I guess some people can't take any criticism. Sunday. I think Roger's getting a little too obsessed with the idea of eating pizza at 1 in the morning, because he woke, because he woke me up today at that time. Me and the boys are going to get a pizza. You and Gregorina? Tomorrow, Roderick. Tomorrow. I'm actually a bit surprised that he's so excited about going to Papa Tony's, because to be honest, the food there has been just getting worse and worse, while Tony's been jacking up the prices. Apart from that, nothing else happened today, until I received an email this evening. To Heffley Gregory. Subject, Papa Tony's. Greg, meet me at Papa Tony's tomorrow at 1.30 a.m. I'm not sure what those guys are up to, but I'm guessing it involves that like you said it did. XOXO, Holly. So Holly's now on board with the idea of going to Papa Tony's. I try getting Rowley to go too, but I think his parents will ban me from ever seeing him again if I got him to sneak out at midnight. I need a new disguise since the roleplay club was going to recognize my old one, and after looking through my closet, I came up with a good one. Monday. I ended up wearing my church clothes and that fake goatee from my pirate costume, and I have to say, it was pretty convincing. Nice beard, Greg. Roger didn't seem to agree with me, and what he said was enough for me to add a fake mustache to my disguise. When we got to Papa Tony's, the roleplay guys were back there, but there was also someone dressed in all black and wearing a ski mask. I didn't even recognize the person in the ski mask until she talked to me. Over here, Fragly. So I guess my name's Fragly for the rest of the night, even though he looks nothing like my disguise. At least the roleplay guys won't know that I'm spying on them. I'm not sure how many other people named Fragly are out there, but I hope they don't, won't know it's me. Anyways, me and Holly sat and watched the roleplay club as they discussed brewing a potion. I found this a bit unusual, since they were actually doing something related to the graphic novels for once. Another strange thing was the fact that the guys would randomly get up and enter the kitchen. I'm pretty sure they don't work at Papa Tony's, and I'm not even sure if the guy on the counter was letting him in. Actually, the guy at the counter was acting very strange. He didn't seem to bat an eyelid as the roleplay guys went in and out of the kitchen, but he was annoyed that we were just sitting at a table. If you're not buying anything, then get out. Are you going to do something about those kids who got into the kitchen? Kids? I don't recall seeing any kids. Now order up or get out. Well, don't blame me that I didn't warn you about this. Oh, and the guy flat out refused to let me into the kitchen, even though he saw the roleplay guys get up and go in. I'm pretty sure he's helping them do whatever it is that they're up to. Since the guy wouldn't let us into the kitchen no matter how many times we told him the roleplay guys got in there under his watch, I decided the only way to get in would be by distracting him. My first idea was to start a fight with Roderick, which would get the guy to try and break us up. While he did that, Holly would sneak into the kitchen and intercept the roleplay guys. It seemed like a good idea and Roderick's bandmates were all on board with it. Unfortunately, nothing that I would not nothing that I thought would happen ended up happening. Me and Roderick pretended to fight, but the guy just stood at the counter and eventually yelled at us to stop. Eventually, he said that we'd be dealt with if we didn't stop, and he was going to separate us. But the guy had his own way of separating us. All right, you punks want a piece of me? Having nearly avoided this guy's gun, we had to think of a different distraction. I went out to Roderick's van and found an amplifier in the back, as well as some extension cords to a Christina CD I gave him as a gag gift. And the combination of those three men should set the guy off at the counter. What is that awful noise? It's a good thing that the guy can't stand Christina's awful, shrill voice because he went outside to find out where the music was coming from, and with that, we were able to find out what was going on in the kitchen. One thing that I noticed was that there was a really strong smell coming from the kitchen, and it was very addictive. This stuff smells sick, dude. Guys, I think someone's coming. They noticed me, but not before I saw what they were cooking, and it looked like grass in a pot on the stove. Then it dawned on me that this funky was coming from the pot. The guys were trying to defend their activities to extra science homework, but I'm pretty sure they didn't have permission to stink up Papa Tony's. There was only one thing to do, but the guys had other ideas. Wait, the guys are cooking Zaza? No way. Hey, we're calling the cops. Scatter. And with that, the roleplay guys were gone. I thought we wouldn't have anyone to blame for this until I remembered the guy from the counter, and eventually he turned up. The guy must have lost his mustache at some point, and it took me half a second to recognize him. Of course it had to be Dennis Denard. Given how involved he is in illegal activities, I wasn't surprised that he was helping the roleplay guys sync up Papa Tony's with that grass. I'm not even sure why Tony hired him, given his lengthy criminal record. 
I guess Dennis wanted, Dennis wanted to make a run for it, but we had him outnumbered. After we had Dennis surrounded, that was basically it for him. Holly called the cops. He confessed to being behind the funny smell, and they took him away. I wanted to see where the roleplay guys went, but only then that I realized it was actually 3.45 a.m. and that we were running late. I hoped that Dennis might rat them out. Tuesday, as it turns out, Dennis did tell the cops what the roleplay club was really up to. Apparently, they planned on lacing pizza with uh, grass and giving it out to students. I'm not terribly, I'm not entirely sure what grass does to you, but I do know that cooking it is illegal. Actually, the role play guys and Dennis got arrested for several, several years thanks to the grass incident, so I don't think I'll be seeing them again until I get to college. The only th other thing I, that happened was that the police found Colin in Emilio's basement. And I'm not sure what they did to him, but I think they used him to test the grass and give it out vatty smells. Hey guys, wanna smoke a joint with me? Given what happened here, it wouldn't be long before he ends up like Fraggly. And anyhow, I'm getting e either going to end up wearing a gas mask at lunch or sitting at the couple's table with Holly until he gets over his grass obsession. Still, at least the roleplay club got stopped before they could serve grass to the whole school like they reportedly planned. And who knows what would happen then. Guys, don't do Zaza. That's the lesson today. Okay, so that was part one. And that was the second time I recorded that because I recorded all the way through and forgot to turn my mic on because I was muted for some reason. But yeah, so... Next up would actually be Joshi's True Face, but I already read that on the channel, so make sure to go check that out. Not sure why I read it in this order, but I'm getting all caught up now, and I want to finish this series off, so yeah. And there's going to be a link to the Yogurtverse playlist in the description, so go check that out to get caught up on the series. And yeah, so next up we're going to be reading Die of a Wimpy Kid, The True Meaning of Diaper Hands, which comes after Joshi's True Face, so do go watch that video. And yeah, so... This is going to be episode 7 of the Yogurtverse. And just to clarify everything, episode 1, Mystery of Albert Sandy. Episode 2, Inside the Mind of Albert Sandy. Episode 3, Revenge of Albert Sandy. Episode 4, A Man of No Words. Episode 5, We Just Read the Role Play Club. Episode 6 is up on my channel, Josh Eat Your Face. And now episode 7, The True Meaning of Diaper Hands. And also, in this video, we're going to be reading episode 8, A Frenchman in Plain View. Then we're going to be finishing off the last three episodes in their own separate videos coming in the future. So yeah. Let's get straight into it, continuing with uh, the true meaning of diaper hands. But first, previously on the Yogurt First, Joshi's True Face. Previously on the Yogurt First and Joshi's True Face, Joshi was outed by Greg, Holly, and Rowley as the, a former pop punk or rock and roll singer. I don't know. And he has very vulgar lyrics. So yeah, he got cancelled pretty much. That, that's pretty much all there is to it. And now Rowley's into a new band called... Uh, uh, STD, it's a K-pop band, I did not make the name, I'm not writing these, go check out IC Opportunity 9, but yeah, uh, also I really recommend you guys go watch all the previous episodes, because I don't remember everything, I'm just human, let's get into it. The True Meaning of Diaper Hands, Friday, I'm starting to regret giving Rowley that CD, because he's completely obsessed with the band STD, I'm not even sure why he likes them, since they only sing in Korean, but that's all he talks about nowadays, and his obsession is even worse than when he liked Joshi. Hey Greg, can we listen to Buya by STD? It just came out today. Rowley, you've asked me this ten times and the answer is still no. I've been trying to spend as little time with Rowley as possible thanks to this. Hopefully he'll get over his obsession by the time school starts again. In the meantime, I've been spending a lot of time with Holly instead. And that's way more fun than listening to Rowley praising the endless virtues of STD. I'm not sure what if I'm not sure if what we do technically counts as dating, but we hang around a coffee shop and discuss whatever's been going on in our lives. In addition, we've been sharing gossip with other kids in our grade. I've only got stuff on Rally, but Holly got a ton of interesting news about the others kid the other kids. Lately she's been telling me that a lot of the girls have broken up with their boyfriends, probably due to the fact that it's swimsuit weather. Because of this, me and Holly are technically the most popular couple in our grade, something that I never thought would have happened. Saturday. At least I thought we were a couple because Holly came over today and she was looking really upset. Holly told me that I'd, I'd mentioned something about breaking up with her and that we could do so if that's what I really wanted, but I told her I had no intention of doing so. But she then pulled out her phone and showed me a message that I sent yesterday. Greg Heffley, Holly, I hate to tell you this, but there's someone else in my life that I love more than you. Would it be okay if I broke up with you? As soon as I saw that, I knew something fishy was up. I clicked on what I thought was my account, only to discover that it had created two days ago. I scrolled through the page and noticed that the fraud had done a pretty good job of replicating my real page, apart from a single detail. Greg Heffley, Diaper Hands, the movie is now in theaters. Don't miss this chance to see this movie masterpiece. And it's the long haul movie, all oh, that movie's so awful. 
As soon as I saw this, I told Holly how I found it, and I, it took her a second, a half a second to realize that the guy who sent her the breakup message wasn't me. I haven't messaged this, I haven't mentioned this before, but Diaper Hands movie is arguably the worst movie ever made. Some kids in my grades claim that they are two completely different versions of the movie. Apparently the first version was so controversial it got banned after its first screen test. Eric Glick reportedly got a copy of that version and showed it to kids in study hall during the yogurt brainwashing incident. I've heard that the second version took two months to produce because they were trying to get the original release date, so I bet it's horrible. However, the real reason why I hate diaper hands so much is because Bryce Anderson and his cronies saw it and they thought I looked like diaper hands himself. Don't ask me where I, they saw a resemblance. Anyhow, Bryce thought it would be funny to pretend that I was diaper hands and to keep messaging me every day until I respond. Eventually, I responded by blocking Bryce. I guess he wasn't satisfied with that because we got his two goons to message me, even though I blocked them after two days. I already told Holly about what Bryce did during one of their coffee shop chats, and it didn't take long for us to conclude that Bryce is behind the fake account. After all, he's probably mad that a girl like Holly is dating a guy like me. We went over to Bryce's house to confront him, but his mom said that he was busy, so he waited by the door to, in, to his room until he let us in. While I didn't know that Bryce was into Christina, once he saw me though, he went back to his usual self. Hey diaper hands, what do you think you're doing with my girl? Hey, can you stop calling me that? Since when do I belong to you, Bryce? Bryce then went on a bit on some tired about how he and Holly were meant to be, mainly because of popularity and a load of nonsense like stars aligning and that. Everything he said made me made me think that he was behind the fake account, especially since he tried to deny everything. So Bryce, here you've been t pretending to be me online, am I right? If I could pretend to be anyone in the world, why would I choose you? Well, do you at least know anything about what's been going on? There are more of those accounts out there, they're impersonating everyone. After we are done interrogating Bryce, he reverted back to his usual obnoxious self. So Holly, how about you watch Diaper Hands and go with me instead? Absolutely not, and stop calling Greg that. Come on, Diaper Hands is a great movie, plus you should be dating a cool guy, not a loser. Bryce, you're obnoxious and mean. If you don't stop this, I'm going to tell all the girls you like Christina. That last thing shut Bryce up pretty quickly. I'm not sure why so many girls like him, given his poor taste in music and movies. We left him in his room to think about what he said, while well, we went to find more suspects. The only problem was we weren't sure who was behind the fake accounts. My first, I first thought that either Roderick or Heather did this for a laugh. But I remember that me and Holly were just one of several couples who were affected by this, by this whole imposter business. So we ended up going to the hills to see if the other fake account were posting more crap about diaper hands in the movie. So usually, though... This is the guy behind this, a member of the production team? Well, we did some digging and found a ton of fake accounts trying to advertise the movie. Even Whitehead. Anyone gonna go see Diaper Hands this weekend? I know I am. Eugene Hills. Ignore all the hateful reviews. Diaper Hand is the summer's greatest hit. I'm not sure why, but all the fake accounts where we found had at least one, men one post mentioning Diaper Hands. Clearly, there was a hidden meaning behind this movie. And there was only one way for us to find out. Okay, let me warn you. Uh, two days for diaper hands, please. Um, okay, let me warn you that you shouldn't buy any food or drink before watching this. Um, thank me later. Well, that's the first time that Ticket Advice has ever given me advice. We decided to take the guy's word and skip popcorn and soda. The only other people watching diaper hands were a bunch of rowdy kids, and I'm pretty sure they were only there because we saw the movie had diaper in its title and thought it had to be good since it was toilet related. We barely made it through the previews, and those kids were already starting to drive me crazy. But I'd paid for those tickets, and we wanted to find out why the fake accounts were so obsessed with the movie, so we stayed. Diaper Hands basically tells the story about this kid who becomes a viral sensation after a bunch of people film him throwing a tantrum after he sticks his hand in a diaper and he finds it in a ball pit. The kid then tries to turn his reputation around by being near some basketball player, but he has to do it in secret because he's taking advantage of a family road trip for some reason. Unfortunately, we only got to see the first 15 minutes of Diaper Hands because some kid thought it would be funny to dump his soda down Holly's back. This was enough to make us leave and I ended up walking Holly her home. I offered to give her my shirt since hers was all wet, but she politely declined. I guess I need to work out more so I can get a six pack, six pack to show it off. Another news, I now know what the ticket guy meant. It was getting late so I went home, only to discover that Rally was waiting for me in front of my house. I'm not sure why Rowley invited himself over, but I let him in on the condition that he wouldn't mention about S anything about SCD or Korea. When he went in, I noticed that Dad was fiddling with something behind the TV. I thought he was trying to unplug my video game console, but it turned out that he was trying and failing to hook something up to the TV. Dag nabbed these fancy gadgets. 
Apparently, Uncle Gary and da gave Dad some weird box that allows him to watch any movie that ever existed. I'm not sure why Dad bothered trying to hook it up given how little he likes watching TV, but I heard him muttering something about Civil War comp documentaries. For me, though, the real question was whether or not I could watch diaper hands on it. After I told Rally about what I'd done all day, we waited until Mom and Dad went to bed before trying to find diaper hands. As it turns out, there was millions of movies on the box, including lots of R-rated movies I wanted to see, even though Mum claimed that they were inappropriate. We also found diaper hands, but as soon as I clicked on it, I immediately thought of what Bryce said earlier on. Why watch diaper hands when you have access to almost every movie that ever existed? But since we were trying to solve a mystery, we stuck with it. Since Jolly had never seen diaper hands before, I was forced to watch the beginning again. And actually, it was even worse without those rowdy kids distracting me. It's a diaper, it's a diaper. Haha. <laughs> The quality of Diaper Hands was horrible, and it looked like it was filmed on the world's worst camera. It didn't help that the plot made zero sense and consisted of tons of unrelated events. At one point, Diaper Hands went to a county fair and won a, won a pig. Don't ask me what that had to do with him trying to change what people thought of him. We sat through the entire movie, and it just got worse, especially after Diaper Hands pissed off a fat, hairy guy who then proceeded to chase him. This is followed by many more incidents, none of which I can make any sense of, before showing Diaper Hands' family crashing their car and Diaper Hands flying through the air in a boat. He landed in his grandma's swimming pool, and actually, I didn't even know where they were going until I saw that. After the movie, I attempted to discuss it with Rowley, but there wasn't really much to say about it. So, what do you think of the movie? Was it as bad as everyone said it was? Why did the guy's sister have a male voice? I'm pretty sure that whoever made the movie couldn't find actress willing to play the role of Diaper Hand's sister, which explains why she was played by the actor portraying the dad. We then spent the next half hour tearing the movie apart before we went to bed. Just before we turned in for the night, I had one last question for Rowley. Hey, you're not jealous that me and Holly are dating, are you? Nah, why would I be jealous when I got me Myung Suk? At least introducing the rally to SCD prevented him from feeling like a third wheel in my relationship with Holly. Though I'm not sure how his parents let him have a body pillow of that Korean girl. Sunday. After Rally woke up, I decided that we were gonna go we were going to Holly to tell her about the movie. I tried to describe the movie to Holly, but it was really hard to determine what the plot was. I ended up saying that it was about some loser who took advantage of a family road trip to prove that he was cool, but it could have also been a bad action movie about a family road trip gone wrong. Holly asked us if we were able to get any of the actors' names, but unfortunately the version we watched didn't have any credits, so we looked up the movie online and discovered that there was no information about it. Diaper Hands the Movie, directed by question mark, staring question mark, produced by Mash and Sham Productions. Well, a part of the name apart from the name of the production company, someone working for them was stupid enough to publish their address and believe it or not, it was in plain view. And as soon as I saw that, I had an idea. You really think I'm gonna waste my time driving you and your nerd friends around? I managed to bribe Roderick into driving us by telling him that he might get a glimpse of Heather when we stop by the hills. It's good thing he still has a crush on Heather, because I sure do with I could sure do without ever seeing Leland again. The only good thing about Leland is that he has a car with a back seat. Roderick forced us into the back of his van because apparently that's where all the nerds belong. We tried to tell him that Holly was the most popular girl in our grade, as well as Heather's younger sister, but he just turned out this heavy metal music so he couldn't hear us. Roderick even got a mannequin dressed in some of Mom's old clothes to make it look like the passenger seat was occupied. I'm not sure what's more confusing, where he got the mannequin or why he thought a lump of human-shaped plastic was more important. The carpool lane, obviously, Greg, you're so dumb. Eventually, we arrived at Mash and Sham Productions headquarters, and at first, I thought we'd arrive at the wrong place. I guess Diver Hands must have had a really low budget because the production company was based out of somebody's house. And as it turns out, this is the address that we found online, so it had to be there. We went up to the house, only discovered that Bryce Anderson was already there, and he was still obsessing over Diaper Hands. Hey, Diaper Hands, don't you think the Diaper Hands movie is an amazing movie? No, it isn't, and stop calling me that. I don't know what Bryce was doing here, but he was probably going to beg the director to make a sequel. Anyways, he knocks it on the door, and a few minutes later, someone let us in. It didn't take me long to notice that the house was full of random props and other stuff from the Diaper Hands movie, including a pig that was scampering all over the place. This, would have been, this wouldn't have been so bad if the pig wasn't hopping around trying to bite our hands off, so I got Rally and Roderick to take care of it while me and Holly went to track Bryce down. Eventually, Bryce entered a room and we followed him in. We were already pretty surprised when we discovered that someone was already there. I thought Bryce got his, over his love for Holly, but as it turned out, he hadn't, and once he started whining to the guy in the room about it, we immediately regretted having followed him. Mr. Maud, Greg and Holly are still in love and nothing that we tried worked. Alright, let me see what I can do. I thought Rasmus was still mad at me for getting him arrested, but he found something else to complain about. 
I can't believe a loser like you got the most popular girl in our grade. Well, I've become a joke. Well, Preston, I like her, she likes me, and that's that. You think you're funny? Even a total joke can find a way to get girls. Just watch diaper hands. Well, I did, and it was terrible. And what did the road trip have anything to do with that? Preston then went on to claim that the whole point of diaper hands was to prove that he wasn't a loser, even though he became an internet sensation thanks to the pee mud joke. He thought that he attracted girls by playing the basketball player in that movie, but since there weren't really any crowds at the movie, that didn't really work. I was about to ask Preston why he decided to make the movie about a road trip when Bryce and Holly started arguing about something. Bryce, Holly, you don't understand how badly I want to bang you. My dreams are nothing but constant, uh, well, let's just say wet dreams with you. I'm thinking waking up with, Bryce, you had a million chances to get with me, but I don't love you anymore. You're disgusting, disgusting mean, and sexist. Preston, on the other hand, was encouraging Bryce to make a move on Holly. Touch her, Bryce. Touch her where it really matters. Make her squeal. Don't do it. You're going to regret it. I guess I guess Roderick and Rowley, I couldn't catch the pig because it bit Bryce before he could do whatever he planned on doing. So, Halfley, you think you've won? Well, watch as I become the man Holly deserves. At that point, I knew Holly was in danger, and there was only one thing I could do to save her. Well, this wasn't the best place for my first kiss. I was still glad I achieved something over the summer. I'm sure the kiss put both Preston and Bryce off about Holly, and it was only when I realized something about Preston. Wait a minute, they let you out of jail already? I'm pretty sure I saw an article in the newspaper about Preston escaping from jail about a month ago, and my suspicions were confirmed when him and Bryce made a run for it after we threatened to call the cops. We chased him down, down we chased him downstairs, then they took off in one of the minivans used in diaper hands. We raced the loaded diaper van, but unfortunately Preston and Bryce beat us to it. Look out, you're gonna hit that van! On the plus side, the van overheated after the crash, and they were too shaken up after the impact to run off. We called 911, and shortly afterwards, Bryce and, Pre and Preston were taken to a hospital where we while we testified everything we saw. Monday, Preston appeared on the front page of the newspaper, and from what I can tell, Dagmar Hands did nothing to change what everyone thought of him. The Daily Herald, file sensation Preston Mudd arrested following escape from prison. Preston confessed to having created the fake accounts, then he got, and he got transferred to a maximum security prison, where there's less ch chances of him escaping. Bryce got off scotch-free, but he ruined his rep in the process. As for me, well, Rod's been getting on my nerves and he's, ever since he saw me kiss Holly, and I'm not sure when or, or if he's going to stop. Sure, he should be filling out insurance for his van, but I guess he's got to prioritize annoying me. I've been spending a lot of time at the country club thanks to this. Rally and Holly are both members, so I could just check in through either of them. Go fetch us some slushies. And trust me, it doesn't get any better than that. Part 3. Diary of a Wimpy Kid, A Frenchman in Plain View Tuesday. Holly and her family were out of town visiting relatives, so me and Rally decided to play Twisted Wizard Vengeance, which had only come out yesterday. Unfortunately, Mom told us that we had to be outside enjoying the fresh air and she kicked us out of the house. So we ended up sitting on curb, eating popsicles and discussing how we were going to beat Twisted Wizard Vengeance. We sat there for an, a half an hour before someone came up to us. I thought it was Trista coming to apologize for what she did to us last summer, but it turned out to be the last person I ever thought I'd see in plain view. Salut mes mecs, ça roule? It took me a few minutes, but I recognized the guy as M Mahmoud Mamadou Montpierre, my pen pal from 7th grade, and I could certainly do without seeing him ever again. Even though I've moved on from Trista after he ditched us for that lifeguard, I'd much rather talk to her than Mamadou. Well, assuming I even knew what Mamadou was trying to tell us, I dropped friend class after grade 7, so I had no idea what he was saying until I gave him a little heads up. Tu connais le PCG? Il est terrible le PCG. You're in America, speak English. Oh, I'm very sorry for that. Thank you for pointing out my mistake. And by the way, what is your name? Even after that, understanding Mamadou was still... Pr Even after that, understanding Mamadou was still pretty hard thanks to his ridiculously thick accent. I think he wanted to know my name, so I gave him a fake one. Unfortunately, Rowley ratted me out. Ah, uh, me? I I'm, I'm rolling Gropper, bro. Nah, he's Greg Heffley. Greg right, Heffley, so you are the Gregory who is my pen pal in Sankiem? That is so cool, no? At this point, I knew I was screwed, so I told Mama Du I had to leave and me and Rally went to the Jeffersons. On the way there, we ran into Trista. Hi guys, I just heard that a new guy from France moved into our street. By the way guys, if you guys don't know, Trista's like that one like ho from the third Diary of Wimpy Kid book and the, four, and the start of the fourth who like moves into the, on the Surrey street. And then she, like, Greg and Bradley take her to the country club and stuff. And then uh, she switches up on them, does a full 180, and just starts hitting on the lifeguard.
So yeah, Tristan didn't apologize for ditching us last summer, so I just pretended to be interested and then dragged Rowley away. I don't understand why she thought we'd want to talk to her again after what she did to us, but I guess she forgot about the incident. Thanks to that encounter, I ended up discovering that Trista lives right next to Rowley. I don't know why he didn't just go up to her and make her apologize, but then again, he doesn't seem like the kind of person to do so. At least he's got a pretty girl as a neighbor, because my day got even worse when I got home. There was a moving truck parked in front of the house across from ours, which didn't seem too bad until I noticed a familiar figure standing in the driveway. Well, I can't believe I live in the same neighborhood as Mama do. Words cannot describe how much I'm not looking forward to this. Wednesday, I didn't get much sleep last night and I blame Mama Do for that. If there's one type of music I hate more than heavy metal, it's definitely rap. And Mama Do certainly knows how to push my buttons, because he blasted French rap until 2 in the morning. I wondered how his parents let him get away with this, but as it turns out, they're just annoying as he is. Good morning, Mr. F. Lee, I am your new neighbor, Monsieur Montpierre. I'm beginning to think that Dad doesn't like the French very much, judging by how he reacted when Mr. Montpierre barged into our house this morning. I'm pretty sure he got those ideas from Grandpa, who describes the French as a bunch of cheese-eating surrender monkeys. After breakfast, I decided to head to Rowley's and see if he wanted to go to the country club. Fortunately, he did. Even better, Holly came back and she was there too. We all hung out together and I thought that things were finally looking up for me. I told Holly about my encounter with Mama Do and she just laughed it off. And then he proceeded to play rap music on full blast until 2 in the morning. Oh, don't worry, Greg. You'll get over it and learn what's normal in America. I guess that's right, because from what Sheets and Rally told me, people in France act differently than they do in America. Apparently, kissing over there is considered as a re greeting rather than something lovers do. I guess that's why the French have a reputation for being seductive. Though I don't know if that applies to Mamadou. Speaking of which, I saw him again today. I wasn't quite sure how he got into the country club until I noticed that he was with someone. Whoa, je les kiffe les meufs américaines. Uh, I'll translate for you guys. Whoa, American milfs. Mamadou and Alex Aruda were staring at some women in a hot tub. I didn't even know Alex was into girls, but I guess he is. At least I think he is, since he and Mamadou were talking to each other in French. I was the only one of us who took French classes, and unfortunately, they'd left before I was to be able to decipher anything they were saying. When I got home, I decided to play Twisted Wizard Vengeance, but Mom came up to me and randomly announced that we had to go to the Mont Piers for some party. The Mont Piers were holding a housewarming party, and they invited the whole neighborhood, including some people I don't think I've seen in years. Mrs. Mont Pierre then told me that I could go up to Mamadou's room and hang out with him. I wasn't thrilled at all with that idea, but Mom forced me to go. Well, at least Rally was there, though. Trista, Fragley, and a Eric Hulbert were there, too. And only Eric looked like he was having any farm, uh, fun. Okay, why do you have Eric as an A-R-A-I-K? A -A 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 why, why? Okay, Eric is a name spelled with an E, not an A. If you, if you have it with an A, then, bro, you tripping, Don, because that, that's an odd name. I'm getting off track a lot this video. I've had to re-record this, like, seven times. Anyway, French rap is awesome, says Eric with an A. I asked Rally what was going on, and he said Mamadou and Eric started talking about rap, so just, they just ignored all the others. So him, Fragley, and Trista sat around with nothing to do until I turned up. Since I was technically in charge of entertaining those three, I decided to tell them some stories about Mamadou. Seriously, do the French have a disease that prevents them from acting normally? Hey, what's wrong with cursive? Haha. <laughs> I don't know, I wanna find out. I thought everyone was already there, but more people showed up too, including some other idiots. Chirag, Colin, who just sat in the corner and smoked that grass stuff, Alex, Aruda, and Holly. She and I were pretty happy to see each other until she noticed Trista. What do you think you're doing talking to Greg? You think he'll ever talk to you again, even though you never apologized for what you did? You keep saying you'll change, but I haven't seen you do anything to prove it. Oh yeah, you think you could just talk to me like this just because you're so popular and because he's your boyfriend? That doesn't mean no other girl could talk to him. Holly and Tristan then proceeded to have a girl fight, which basically consisted of them yelling insults at each other until I broke them up. I'm sorry I ditched Greg and Rally never apologized for doing so. I'm sorry that I yelled at you and accused of, of stealing Greg. I mean, he briefly had a crush on you. Okay, maybe making them hug wasn't the best idea, but that's what the slumber party pals always do after they argue. Holly gave me all her old copies, and ever since then, I've been cooked. I mean, Mom's glad that I'm spending more time reading thanks to that. Apart from that, nothing really happened during the rest of the party. I continued to tell Rowley, Holly, Trista, Fragley, and Chirag about my experience with Mamadou, while everyone else was arguing about whether or not French rap was better than its American counterpart. I'm not sure what the point of forcing us all into Mamadou's room was, but I'm starting to wonder if this was just some way for him to make friends or something. 
All in all, I can only say that I'm not making friends with Mamadou anytime soon, apart from his awful taste in music he also smokes in his room even though I don't think he's old enough to buy cigarettes. Thursday. I'd say that the worst part of living near Mamadou is his habit of blasting rap music at midnight. I thought that was a one-off instant, but he did it again last night. I ain't reading all that. I, I told mum and dad about the rap, and as it turns out, dad went over to Mont Pierre's last night to complain about the noise, only for no one to answer. To make matters worse, dad says he already told Mr. Mont Pierre to get Mamadou to turn down his music while he was at the housewarming. Either the Mont Pierre's are really bad listeners, or something's going on. I didn't see Mamadou again until his afternoon, where I noticed him and a few friends getting into a car. This is pretty confusing since Mamadou was driving. I don't know where he learned to drive, or if he's even allowed to. I'm pretty sure he doesn't get an American license, driver's license, so don't ask me how he'll get away with this. I don't know what they were planning on doing, but I'm guessing that they were cruising around town trying to attract girls while blasting French rap. Holly described what they were doing as disgusting. Not Holly, bro, that's W Riz right there. And I'm not sure if any girls actually find this attractive. Maybe Mamadou could attract someone with this French charm, but I don't think no, I don't know what girls around here think of French rap. Mamadou blesses his French rap again, and Dad finally snapped. And since I knew more about Mamadou than anyone else in our house, he made me come with him. I guess the Montpiers are really lax about safety, since we were able to pry a window open and get in. But that was just the beginning of the madness. We discovered that the rap was coming from an empty room with a boombox in it. I thought this was kind of a modern art installation or something, which I didn't think I'd find in someone's house. Things started to go completely insane after we turned on the rap and tried to find the Montpiers, only to discover they were gone. We were the only ones in that house and it felt really awkward. Eventually, we heard a door open and we thought it was the Montpiers, but it turned out to be a bunch of random teenagers. I don't know if they were robbing the place, but they looked like they were up to no good. As soon as the teenagers arrived, we hid behind the sofa. This allowed us to eavesdrop on their conversation. Hey, someone turned off the rap. Well, I've got a better idea. I'll show you. Now hurry. Mamadou's waiting for us and we've got the rest of Plainview to do. Well, we still don't know what those teenagers are up to. I'm pretty sure it's some sketchy business involving the Montpierre family. Suddenly, Mamadou's starting to intrigue me. Unfortunately, they drove off and we couldn't catch them since none of us had our driver's licenses. I almost thought about stealing Roderick's van until I remembered that it couldn't drive straight after the accident, so we bailed out and got Fragley to watch for Mamadou in his front yard. Saturday. Mamadou didn't blast his rap last night, so I actually managed to sleep for once, but after I got up, I noticed that the eyes in the framed photo of Uncle Charlie were following me around. I'm not sure if I was just hallucinating since I hadn't slept much in the past three nights, but I'm pretty sure someone was watching me. I tried to forget about it, but I couldn't stop wondering if somebody was spying on me. And eventually, I couldn't take it anymore, and I yanked the photo off the wall. Then I discovered what was behind it. There was a camera behind the photo of Uncle Charlie. I don't know how that ever got there. At this point, I began to wonder how many more cameras were hidden around the house. I found my second one in the bathroom when I was about to take a shower. I don't remember a camera ever being there, and I'm not sure how it got there. I thought Mama Roderick put it there until I discovered that there was at least one camera in every room of the house. Then I began to wonder if this had anything to do with Mama Doo's boxes. Was this really what he was up to? After removing all the cameras, I went over to Fragley to see if he had any news regarding Mamadou, and it, as it turns out, he did. That Mamadou guy, he went into the house across from mine. I don't know what he's doing, but he and his boys had several boxes with them. So Mamadou is breaking into houses. I'm starting to wonder if he was the one who put all the cameras in our house, since that would also explain what's in the boxes. I didn't shower last night, and I was out all morning, which would explain why I didn't find the camera until today. I then began to wonder if Mamadou rigged the hills' house as well. If he did, I'm not letting him see Holly shower. And with that, I raced to Holly's house. I never did well in gym class, so I'm surprised I managed to run the whole way. When I got to Holly's, I told her about the cameras and we started looking around for them. I ended up removing tons of cameras in her house, including a half a dozen in her and Heather's rooms. I'm not surprised by that, but I just hope Mamadou hasn't checked any of them. After that, we decided to inform the others and told them to meet up at my house. Who wants some shrinky dinks? I do, I do, me too. As it turns out, all of us except Fragley found cameras in our houses. I guess Fragley got spared because he was standing in his front yard the whole time and Mamadou thought he was watching him. But what we really confuses what really confuses me is what Mamadou plans to do with all these cameras. His goons did mention they were doing all of plain view, and that doesn't sound good. After way too many shrinky dinks, courtesy of Mum, we headed to the country club to find Mamadou. Once we found him, we got Tristan to go speak to him. Salut, j'ai entendu parler que t'es nouveau ici. Est-ce que c'est vrai? Eh oui, je suis Mamadou Montpierre, et toi? 
Trisha then told Mamadou about the cameras, and she says he denied knowing anything about them. But no, nous non, nous non pas uh, reçu les caméras dans notre maison. Alors, tu sais quelque chose sur ces caméras qui a participé partout? According to Trista, Mamadou said he didn't get any cameras in his house, and that just makes me think he's a suspect. We know he went out for several hours yesterday, and somehow the troublemakers didn't rig his house. As we headed back to my house, I spotted Mamadou's car and parked in Fregley's driveway with its tailgate open. Then I had an idea. I sent Fregley in to get us some knives while the rest of us raided Mamadou's trunk, and believe it or not, there was hundreds of cameras in those boxes. We all agreed we couldn't let Mama Duke and his team get away with this, but before we could decide what to do with the cameras, Fragley came back with some knives, and I didn't think Mama Duke had a mole to rat us out. Hey! And he pops their tie, that's ruthless, Greg. After that, we all made a run for it, but not before I grabbed the box of cameras and chucked it into the path of an oncoming car. We ended up hiding in my house since it was the closest, but Mama Duke's goons kept banging on the windows until Dad told them to leave. Dag nab you rotten teenagers, I'm calling the cops. After that, Dad got me to explain what this was all about, so he told him about Mamadou rigging all the houses with hidden cameras. Dad was pretty concerned about the cameras, especially the ones in the bathroom since he didn't want anyone to find out about his big problem. I don't know what he's doing in the bathroom, but I think I'll save that for another time. Anyways, after we told Dad that Mamadou was behind the cameras, we all, we all went over to his house to confront him. Here for some camam camembert. Mamadou wasn't home, but his dad was. After we managed to convince Mr. Montpierre that we didn't want any of his foul-smelling cheese, we got him to tell us what the purpose of the cameras was, or at least what he claimed it was. The cameras are there for security reasons. We want to keep you safe, oui? Okay, but why did you have to put one in my shower? The rest of the conversation wasn't much better, as Dad accused Mr. Montpierre of tampering with our house without his approval. Then again, the Montpierres plan on doing this to every single house in Plainview, and I don't, if, I don't know if anybody else knows that Mr. Montpierre is watching them shower. I was about to question whether or not he had some fetter shirt for naked middle-aged men when I remembered that me and Holly found five cameras in her bathroom, and that made me question Mr. Montpierre's intentions. Sunday. I found the answer to my question after Dad made me go downstairs to kick Roderick out of his room. I thought Roderick would be fast asleep, but I found him staring at his computer with a huge grin on his face. I thought he was looking at porn, but it turned out to be something a lot weirder. Livecam.com. Real people, real lives. I wasn't entirely sure if the girl in the video knew someone was filming her while she bathed, but what caught my eye was the plain view tab in the top right corner. After I kicked Roderick out, I told Dad about www.livecam.com. But he wasn't really that interested after he couldn't find any cameras wired up to our house. I don't know why he was so concerned about Mr. Montpierre seeing him shower. Anyways, I saw the Montpierre's driveway and I had an idea. Theory? Frank has it showed. Hear me out. I thought the Montpierre's would have taken greater security measures after me and Dad got in, but I was able to pry open a window just as easily as last time. Then called up the others and started searching the house. I found Alex Aruda sitting in front of the computer, staring at what it was clearly footage of random people's houses. As soon as I saw this, I knew that Alex had something to do with www.livecam.com, and I proceeded to interrogate him about it. So Alex, you've been watching people shower, haven't you? No, I haven't. I've been maintaining the site and making sure it runs well. Plus, I'm only doing it because the pay is good. I don't know what Alex has to do with this, but since I've been seeing him, seeing him talking to Mahmood, I'm beginning to think he's pulling my leg. After everyone else arrived, I began to search the house for anything that looked like it had to do with the Montpierre's website. Eventually, Shirag found this big binder which helped said shed some light on livecam.com. Statistics and remarks on livecam.com. July 20th to August 20th. Thanks to Trista, we were able to understand what was in there and it made the Montier's plan much clearer. 23 à faire recourir l'essai gratuit d'un mois jusqu'à deux semaines. Augmenter le tarif mensuel de 15 dollars, 16 dollars, 17 dollars jusqu'à 25 dollars, 28 dollars. Vérifier que tous les caméras à plein view marchent. So apparently, the Montiers were making money off this illegal business. We then found some binders suggesting that they'd somehow gotten away with this for years. We were about to continue looking when Mr. Montier came in. At this point, I knew we were screwed. What are you doing here, Monsieur Hefley? We tried to confront Mr. Montpierre about his illegal business, but he seemed more interested in getting us arrested. It doesn't matter. You have broken into my house. I am calling la police. You are aware that what you've been doing is illegal, aren't you? You've been doing the exact same thing for years, Mr. Montpierre. I thought we were doomed at that point until I came up with a response. Don't count on it, Mr. Montpierre. We've seen all those binders, and we know we, you have, and we know everything you've done. 
As soon as he heard this, Mintermont peered and bloated his binders in some bag, kicked us out of his house, and left. I'm not sure if he was turning himself into the police or trying to escape, but I guess he didn't want much, much a bunch of teenagers revealing what he was up to. As it turns out, he did turn himself into the police. He was even on the news thanks to that. French businessman Regis Montpierre has confessed to being behind the infamous LiveCam.com website. Montpierre, along with his wife Odile and his son Modou, reportedly rigged more than a thousand houses across France, along with a dozen in the United States with hidden cameras. I was also mentioned in the report as a guy who got Mr. Montpierre to turn himself in. I'm not sure if that's a good thing or not. Monday. The news about the Montpierre's in the paper today, and I just had to show it to Dad since he's holding a grudge against them as far as I know. You know that family from the French family across the road? Wait, what? Well, that actually got Dad in a good mood for once, even though he said he had to go to work today. I guess he's just happy you won't have to listen to French rap for a while. As for me, well, I just had to thank everyone for helping me get rid of Mama Du, so I invited them all to the town pool. I mean, sound, summer's winding down, and Mom keeps saying I should make, make the most of what's left, and I sure think I did. The end. Hope you guys enjoyed this three-parter. Make sure to like and subscribe, and I'm out of here. Bye.